स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Hello, welcome back to NPTEL, the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning. As you are aware, we are in a series of video lectures or video uh, virtual classes uh, in the domain of cultural studies and uh, these lectures are targeted or the target audience is uh, are the engineering students in various uh, um, IITs and uh, engineering institutes, institutions in India. Uh, many of you are aware that uh, the humanities and social sciences float elective courses in various areas uh, and in various disciplines in the humanities and social sciences and cultural studies is one such course uh, and one that I teach at IIT Guwahati. We have al already been through a couple of lectures and by now you are aware of the you know the basic propositions um, and the scope of cultural studies. We also began by saying that it is, uh, it is not wise as many critics have pointed out to leave out okay, the science, uh, what science has to tell us about culture and hence we are also devoting uh, a couple of lectures to um, you know, to an exploration of what science can, can tell us about culture and how also cultural studies may benefit from, uh, from the sciences. So, as always let us do a recap of the last lecture and you will recall that in the last lecture we found that you know incorporating studies of the mind. Okay, um, uh, looking at the human mind and particularly the way it has evolved is one of the basic requirements in cultural studies. Why? Because um, it is the mind, isn't it, that gives us culture, okay, that gives us various thoughts, various feelings, various theories and leads us to organize our socio-cultural lives in particular ways, right. So, the, if you look at the slide here, the mind uh, within this uh, is seen as a set of information processing machines. Okay. You will see that there is a definite shift here from, from traditional ways of understanding the mind. For instance, um, in different religions the mind is understood uh, certainly not as a set of information processing machines. But if we look at what um, you know study of science and biology and evolution, evolutionary theory, Darwinian theory have to tell us you know they have to tell us about uh, the mind, our mind that forms or creates culture, then we may we have to uh, you know go uh, to a discourse that tells us that the mind is indeed a set of information processing machines. The mind is also second as we saw designed by natural selection uh, in order to solve adaptive problems which we are faced by our hunter gatherer ancestors. And we saw that in the last lecture that it is important uh, to realize that um, our minds are actually not sort of I would not say suited, but uh, you know it is not designed to, to solve um, to solve our current uh, problems as much as it is designed to solve certain uh, evolutionary or adaptive problems. The goal therefore of evolutionary psychology we saw was to discover and understand the design and structure of the human mind. So, there are two points that we saw the design and the structure of the human mind. This is what evolutionary psychology looks at. Therefore, we called evolutionary psychology after um, the scholars Tubi uh, and Cosmides an approach to psychology, not really a branch of psychology, an approach to psychology where knowledge and principles from evolutionary biology uh, are sort of gleaned or, 
uh, you know, borrowed uh, for research on the structure of the human mind. So, evolutionary biology we saw was the main uh, sort of domain from which evolutionary psychology uh, you know, draws its inspiration in order to tell us um, you know, or order to give us information and knowledge about how the human mind um, originated, about how the human mind developed over evolutionary time. So, well, uh, the, uh, let us go to the key source texts in um, our lecture here and the key uh, source texts in our uh, lecture today are Chris Barker's Cultural Studies Theory and Practice and Lida Kusmaidis and John Tooby's Evolutionary Psychology uh, Primer. Now, we have already been through some of the formulations uh, given in this domain and we will uh, in this lecture quickly move on to the principles of evolutionary psychology. Well, we could even say that the lectures, um, uh, sorry, the, that today's lecture is devoted uh, mainly to the five principles um, of evolutionary psychology. So, these principles as you know uh, have been given to us by uh, the evolutionary scholars Lida Kosmaidis and John Tooby and um, today we will really focus on uh, uh, you know um, the the principles as as have been given to us by Tooby and Kosmaidis. It is not that there are uh, there are not other um, there are that they, there are not other principles, but uh, we should I think choose one text okay, so that we there are no overlaps when we uh, kind of glean the uh, principles from several texts. So, we are going to look at the principles of evolutionary psychology, the foundation foundational principles so to speak that have been given to us by Kosmides and Tooby. First principle number one, it says that the brain is a physical system, it functions as a computer. Okay. Look at the analogy uh, with the computer. Remember just a while ago we had said that uh, under the domain of evolutionary psychology, we find that um, the mind is seen as a set of information processing machines right? or sets of information processing machines. In the same way as the computer is a, you know a compu computer uh, processes information. Right? So, the brain within this domain is seen as a, as a physical system, it functions as a computer, its circuits are designed to generate behavior that is appropriate to your environmental circumstances. Now, we need to look very carefully, indeed this principle is very carefully worded okay, or written out or worded by the scholars. Okay. A is what? The brain is a physical system, it is uh, it functions uh, like a computer, okay, it, it processes information and the circuits here, the circuits of the brain are for a purpose. Okay. What is the purpose of the, you know, the circuits of the brain? The purpose is this, that it has to generate behavior okay, in beings, right, in organisms. It has to generate behavior towards a certain goal or purpose and what is it that that behavior which is generated by these set of sets of information processing machines called the circuits in the brain should be appropriate okay should be appropriate to our environmental circumstances this also is an extremely important word and we shall see in a while what appropriate means okay so what is the first principle the first principle says that the brain is a computer and uh, its circuits are information processing machines and there, the, there is a certain purpose in these you know as they as information is received and you know uh, and uh, decisions are taken. Uh, it is this that it has to generate behavior, the circuits have to generate behavior in organisms okay, uh, not any random kind of behavior, behavior that is appropriate okay, to the environmental circumstances in which the uh, uh, the organism lives. So, from this it also follows therefore, that uh, behavior appropriate behavior okay, appropriateness or what is appropriate behavior will definitely even if you look around and look at different organism species you will understand that uh, or it is not difficult really to, to, to uh, understand that appropriate behavior is different from 
uh, organism to organism, okay, from species to species. What is inappropriate for a species may be very appropriate for another. Therefore, if you look at this uh, as a diagram, the brain is a physical system, okay, which functions, functions like a computer in order to generate appropriate behavior and the brain is governed by the laws of physics and chemistry. This may sound a bit reductionist as you know uh, or, or um, sort of we may think well all the rich content that we have in our minds, the beautiful art products that we do when we fall in love for instance, does it mean that these are only governed, these are all to do with uh, chemical signals. Indeed, at this level it is so, but it does not do at all do away with the fact that our minds uh, generate very rich content. Okay. So, in this case we have to understand and we have to accept the fact that our brains and what happens inside our brains, okay, um, this is governed by the laws of physics and chemistry. Therefore, what is appropriate behavior? Right, I said I would come to this point. What is appropriate behavior and we found initially that appropriate behavior is behavior that is appropriate to one's um, uh, environmental circumstances. Now, let us read from Tubi and Cosmides text. This is what they have to say. A. Different organisms may have different appropriate behavior for the same environment. This is immensely important as you understand begin to understand culture okay, in, in the broadest sense of the term culture which also includes the way of living of, of different, uh, different organisms of different animals for instance and to see how the way of living is different okay, how um, you know they are different from one another. So, different organisms have different appropriate okay, appropriate behavior for the same environment. This is important, the environment may be the same. Second, the while the appropriate behavior for a machine is decided by an engineer, we know who has you know uh, who, who makes a machine, the engineer makes the machine with a certain purpose in mind okay, thinking that it is going to serve uh, a certain purpose. So, the while uh, uh, for a machine for uh, or, or silicon based uh, you know machine, uh, the, uh, the, the appropriate behavior is already decided by an engineer. We may ask the question in that case who engineers our appropriate behavior. Okay. So, this is an important question to which the answer given by Tubi and Cosmides is this. The appropriate behavior for a particular situation is decided for okay for organisms by a process called natural selection. So, if the engineer is uh, you know the one who decides the appropriate behavior or who drives the appropriate behavior for a machine for us okay, the appropriate behavior is decided by or we at least we have to respond to or adapt to what the principle of natural selection which you remember was given to us by one of the greatest scientists that is Charles Darwin. right? So, our brain if you look at the slide here the brain interestingly can also be called a wet computer. Okay. Now, again this is you know go carrying on the analogy between the brain and um, uh, the computer. The brain is a wet computer. Okay. It is not a silicon based computer, it is a carbon based computer right, which whose job is the processing of information and it is an organic carbon based computer or which we call a wet computer. But the function is analogous to the uh, you know of the brain is an analogous to the function of the computer and what was it you will recall from a couple of slides ago. If I ask you what was what is you know uh, the function of the brain, the function of the brain that is the function of the various circuits of the brain is uh, you know to process information right. To process information the brain is a set of information processing mechanisms and the, uh, this is towards a particular goal and the goal is to do what to generate appropriate behavior under environmental circumstances. The brain 
Uh, just, uh, I'm sure many of you are aware of this, but just to recapitulate, the brain therefore comprises, among other things, neurons and neuroglia, neuroglia or supporting, uh, you know, uh, structures which are also known as uh, neural glue, for instance, ne uh, 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 neurons and supporting structures, whose job is to transmit information. The circuitry of the brain, according to Tubi and Cosmides, is to generate motion. Okay? And remember, this word behavior, no matter how we understand the word behavior okay, in our uh, common parlance, in our everyday parlance, means something very particular in, uh, the, uh, you know, in, the, in evolutionary psychology. Behavior here is defined as motion, this is very important. Okay? So, just a while ago we said that the brain uh, has neurons and supporting structures whose job is to transmit information. Right? So, we find here the transmitting of information eventually has to lead to motion and which is known as behavior and this is again related to information that is received from the environment. Okay. So, we are talking a bit about the brain here, because obviously, we uh, you know in this domain we believe that the mind emanates from the brain and hence in the beginning it is important for us to see how the brain, uh, the brain operates. Okay. Now, we come to the second principle as given to us, as has been given to us by Tubi and Cosmides. Now, principle 2 uh, as described by uh, Tubi and Cosmides goes like this and these are their words. Our neural circuits were designed by natural selection to solve problems. This is A. Our neural circuits were designed by natural selection to solve problems. What kind of problems? problems that our ancestors face during our species evolutionary history. It is very important for us to remind ourselves again that evolutionary psychology is also you know the methodology is what we call reverse engineering and those of, of you who are from uh, from engineering would know uh, this very well. Okay? So, you sort of um, go you dismantle Okay, you dismantle a product or a machine in or and go back in order to see how it was created. Right? So, if we have to understand the whole point of doing this in this course is this, if we have to understand how our minds work, then we would have to understand um, why it was there in the first place right? and how it evolved, which means asking questions like what were the problems okay, in our species evolutionary history for which the circuits were developed. Okay? So, you see how principle 2 follows beautifully from principle 1. Okay? Our circuits were developed to generate behavior okay, with, this, with the purpose of uh, you know, um, adapting to the pressures of natural selection. Okay? And here we find that those problems, our neural circuits were designed by uh, natural selection to solve not current problems, but to solve those problems which our ancestors had faced in our evolutionary history. Okay? More about this and you will find that other principles will also uh, you know throw light on these first two principles. Now, a quick look again at Darwin's The Origin of Species, which was published in 1859. And I am quoting from the origin of species, because this will make clear the uh, principle of natural selection. Very beautifully put by Darwin, uh, certainly long uh, sentences as going by 19th century writing. But uh, let us look at the two pillars, so to speak, of Darwinian um, evolutionary theory. That species adapt. Okay? species adapt to changes in their environment okay? um, and this you know had there not been two drives called survival and reproduction perhaps species would not uh, have adapted. Okay? So, species therefore, A need to survive and B they need to reproduce. 
So, let us read um, this is straight from Darwin's origin of species. Darwin said owing to this struggle for life, okay, this is very important owing to this struggle for life any variation that is any change any variation however slight and from whatever cause proceeding if it be in any degree profitable to an individual of any species in its infinitely complex relations to other organic beings and to external nature will tend to the preservation of that individual and will generally be inherited by its offspring. I have called this principle by which each slight variation if useful is preserved by the term natural selection. Okay. So, what Darwin is saying here very clearly is that there is a struggle, okay, there is a struggle for life and in our struggle for life there are certain changes which help us to adapt. Okay. Any variation he says remember any variation if useful is preserved in the individual A. Not only that it is also that variation is also passed on to succeeding generations. Right? So, much so that ultimately those generations you know those members or those generations which have been able to retain that useful variation you will find more uh, people you know more members or more uh, people in that population than those who do did not have that useful variation those are going to be extinct or those are going to die out or for instance uh, those are not going to succeed in the struggle for life or struggle for existence and then he said says that will be inherited by its offspring and I have called the, he says I have called this principle by which each of these changes useful changes okay, is preserved. I have named this principle that of natural selection. This is uh, you may say as you know you as scientists as technologists will recognize that this is perhaps one of if not the most or one at least one of the most important uh, theoretical formulations and findings that could have been given by any scientist ever really. Okay. So, the main points here in Darwin's uh, Darwinian theory um, which has uh, you know the points which have a lot of consequences even for culture are these that they are very vari variation okay, inheritance high rate of population and growth where there is a struggle for survival or struggle for life and importantly differential survival and reproduction. Okay. It is not exactly survival per se that we are talking about. Okay. We are talking about differential survival. What might differential survival mean? You know uh, there has to be a, a, a difference okay, among uh, you know um, among a group that is you know uh, that that is in the struggle for life or struggle for survival and reproduction. Okay. And whoever gains in the whoever has that differentiating so to speak element or variation in them okay, will survive. Hence, the survival or the reproduction is known not as reproduction and survival per se remember this, uh, this is extremely important or it is also known as a and more importantly we should call it a differential survival and reproduction. Therefore, we have to understand also as Subi and Cosmides have brought to our notice that that natural selection it does not mean that you know it works always for the benefit of the species in the way in the commonsensical way that we may think it to be. Okay. Uh, it is just a process in which a trait or a characteristic causes its own spread through a population sometimes even leading to the extinction of the species. Okay. So, we should not think that natural selection is a sort of um, a process that always be useful for the benefit of the species. If the species does not adapt or does not produce appropriate behavior okay, for the circumstances for the changes or the selection pressures then the species will not survive. Therefore, the problems which we have faced during our species evolutionary history has to do with a certain pressure. Okay. So, we used this term a while ago the pressure is natural selection is a selection pressure on our neural circuits to do what to produce appropriate behavior. 
So, then we also talked about problems and we are going to ask what kind of problems and we are, are we talking about. Remember natural uh, selection gives uh, uh, there is a selection pressure species will have to solve these problems the neural circuitry will have to process information and generate behavior which are towards uh, which are geared towards the solving of the problems right. So, what kind of problems are we really talking about? So, we these are spelled out by the authors. Okay. These problems are called adaptive information processing problems. We will term these adaptive information processing problems and these are among the most important ones are these four. A face recognition, B threat interpretation, C language and D navigation. If you look at all of these, these are not simply things to do with biology. Okay. This is to do definitely with survival, but face recognition in uh, in a uh, you know of by members in a certain population for instance, uh, which uh, which face is a threatening face, which face is a friendly face for instance, threat interpretation also where, you know um, to be able to interpret if you cannot interpret a threat and produce a behavior that is appropriate towards a threat, then you cannot survive right. So, face recognition, threat interpretation, eventually language also right, language and navigation in a, to be able to navigate in a, a certain territory or locale, these are what uh, have been termed as a basic adaptive problems by to be and Cosmides. So, behavior therefore, as we saw is a directed, we will call it a directed after Tubi and Cosmides, we, we shall call it a directed response of an organism to one's environment and which is the response is both chemical and physical. So, behavior again is can be divided into innate behavior and learned behavior. Innate behavior is behavior that is developmentally fixed, whereas learned behavior is behavior that is modified by experience. So, this learned behavior is a behavior as information processing machines that are geared towards survival and uh, you know reproduction that has to be modified by experience in a changing world okay, or in a changing scenario and this, this these decisions this learning and changing is a job that is performed by our neural circuitry. Well, now we come to principle number 3, the third principle of evolutionary psychology as um, was given or has been given to us by uh, Lida Cosmides and John Tooby. Let us read from here. In their words, the third principle goes like this. It has to do with our consciousness. Consciousness is just the tip of the iceberg. Most of what goes on in your mind is hidden from you. This is very important. Okay? Most of what goes on in our mind is something that we do not experience or we do not know or do not have access to. Then as a result your conscious experience can mislead you into thinking that our circuitry is simpler than it really is sorry than it should be than than it really is. Most problems that you experience as easy to solve are very difficult to solve. They require very complicated neural circuitry. Now, what is consciousness? Now, obviously consciousness um, is defined in different ways okay, uh, by, um, by people from different domains. For instance, in religion uh, consciousness may be defined in, in, in many ways, it may be called chitta for instance in, in Hindu. Um, in the Hindu religion or it may have so many different uh, uh, different ways of description. Many may even say that consciousness is something that is given to us by you know some supernatural power for instance. Okay. But we have to remember that we are in speak, speaking in the discourse within the discourse and within the limits of science right. And how do we look at consciousness here? Okay. The, the authors say that consciousness here is what that is our conscious awareness. Okay, I am aware that I am here, I am speaking to you, uh, that this, this uh, uh, lecture is being recorded, that this is a virtual uh, you know class going on and that you perhaps you are listening uh, to, uh, to me. Okay. Uh, I am aware of this, right? but this awareness 
uh, both yours and mine is just as they say the tip of the iceberg. There are many processes that are going on in our brains even as I am speaking or I am aware of my surroundings and you are aware of watching this video lecture. Okay? There are several sets, there are several sets of information processing that um, you know uh, that are at work at this very moment as I speak and you um, listen to me. Okay? Um, um, and, uh, this the our consciousness or awareness of what is going on is just you know, just a fraction of what actually is going on in our brains. Okay? So, as they say as a result your conscious experience may even mislead us into thinking that our neural circuitry is extremely simple. Right? One of perhaps one of the difficulties in modeling uh, you know the, the human mind and its workings uh, through computers or maybe you know uh, artificial intelligence systems is also this is that the, the enormous you know what we may call um, the, in, uh, the enormously complex ways in which the brain works right and which gives rise to the mind is something which is not perhaps which has not been decoded at least in its entirety okay, by technology. Right? Uh, otherwise, we would have been able to make uh, machines as complex as us. So, as a result our conscious mind may mislead us into thinking that our circuitry is really um, simple than it really is. And most problems that we experience as easy to solve are really very difficult to solve. And as they say they require very complicated neural machinery. Right? So, this is principle 3. Um, uh, three of evolutionary psychology and consciousness therefore, um, as we saw uh, we are looking at it as awareness okay, as in the first place as an awareness of what is going on. Okay. It is also our subjective experience right, uh, the experience that we undertake or undergo as uh, perceiving subjects, as knowing subjects, as remembering subjects, as subjects paying attention to something. Okay? And finally, it also means the wakefulness of the mind. So, we have to understand that in each of these different ways of looking at consciousness, okay, the, the underlying circuitry of the brain and its processes right there is no is by no means simple at all for, for things that uh, you know uh, um, we experience in these uh, domains, okay, these require very complicated um, neural machinery. Okay. So, let us again look at what Leda uh, Cosmides and John Tooby have to say. The only things you become aware of are a few high level conclusions passed on by thousands and thousands of specialized mechanisms. They say that the mechanisms Okay, that finally bring things to our awareness working sort of below the surface if I may use the metaphor. Okay, mechanisms run up to thousands of mechanisms. Okay. We are only aware of a few high level conclusions like if I am aware that I am here uh, you know in a recording studio uh, recording this lecture this is a high level conclusion that I am aware of. But behind this Right, what is happening inside um, you know my brain is something that I cannot be aware of. One of the reasons perhaps is, this, is that our conscious awareness cannot handle so much of information overload and we are not required really to know the processes. This interestingly you will understand is also uh, you know a survival strategy. Right? If, our, if our minds are overloaded, if there is over information uh, then um, and then there are you know uh, there are things that will we will miss right in this overloading of information which may ultimately uh, compromise our ability to survive. So, reading on again some that are gathering sensory information from the world, others that are analyzing and evaluating that information, checking for inconsistencies, filling in the blanks, figuring out what it all means. Okay, there is another example which I am not bringing here which is given in uh, to be and Kasmaid is a text. They say that when uh, you know when a person looks at and recognizes his or her mother right, uh, he or she is aware of just that 
high level conclusion that this is my mother right but they say that in reality okay, what is actually going on in our brains is that you know uh, the visual system gives us an input okay as you know what our mother looks like okay then uh, there are you know the you know uh, we we re we remember the fact our relationship with that person okay so there are there are thousands of mechanisms or there are several mechanisms that are at work even in the simple even everyday act of our recognizing somebody as our mother and uh, in in very unfortunate cases where, where you know um, uh, where people have you know perhaps met with an accident or there is a lesion in the brain what happens is at times when one can't recognize one's own mother for instance it is a case where these underlying thousands of you know mechanisms that produce the result have been uh, compromised in some way okay in in fact one of uh, the ways uh, initially that one could have that one could the scientists could gather uh, or make speculations um, successful speculations about how the brain works is by was by looking at um, patients who have had their uh, brain functions unfortunately uh, uh, compromised. Okay. So, we are now going to principle number 4 and this is very interesting principle number 4 according to Leda Kosmides and John Tooby runs like this that different neural circuits are specialized for solving different adaptive problems right look at the the importance of this which means that our brain is not an all purpose machine okay and uh, as they say also in their text really as engineers you will uh, you know very well that an all purpose machine is no good okay as they say a hammer is meant to perform the job of a, of a hammer. A hammer cannot function as a saw, right. So, you know a system will be successful when it is not an all purpose machine. The system will be successful when different components are uh, serving different needs or different goals, fulfilling different goals. So, different neural circuits are specialized, let us look at this, different neural circuits are specialized for solving different adaptive problems right. Uh, the, and again remember we said that evolutionary biology is very important or it is the inspiration or it is sort of even the template from which evolutionary psychology draws its uh, you know draws its con conclusion or has a certain methodology ok. So, if you look at the human body for instance ok, uh, what does the brain uh, what does the liver do for right. The liver does not for here uh, for instance the liver is meant for detoxifying poisons. The liver does not pump blood in us. Okay. Lungs are for respiration, kidneys for waste treatment, the heart for pumping blood and liver for detoxification purposes. Right. So, the like as the body right as our body as a different uh, you know as our body has different uh, you may say circuits which are the organs right like the lungs, kidneys, heart and liver to perform specialized jobs right. So, also it is held that our brains or our mind right our brains uh, are have circuits which are specialized okay, to perform certain jobs. So, again reading from Tubi and Cosmides for the same reason our minds consist of a large number of circuits that are functionally specialized. For example, we have some neural circuits whose design is specialized for vision all they do is help you see. In the same way we have circuits that are designed um, uh, for motor purposes, circuits that are designed for hearing, for sense, for smell etcetera. Okay. So, the circuits that are doing the job of smell of, get, of, of uh, enabling us to smell are not performing uh, you know some other job of uh, you know of some other sensory input. So, the design of other neural circuits is specialized for hearing all they do is detect changes in air pressure and extract information from it. They do not participate in vision, vomiting, vanity, vengeance or anything else. Okay. Uh, so, this is just uh, you know um, very beautifully rhetorically putting it right. So, that just uh, to say that those circuits which are engaged in particular jobs uh, are not uh, you know it, it may safely make a general statement uh, are not at least to 
uh, in important ways um, uh, concerned with or doing or helping in uh, you know um, the job of other kind of conclusions or uh, other uh, circuits that give us, us other conclusions they are not specialized okay they are, uh, you know that is they are not spread out over different specializing domains so finally principle number 5 also put very beautifully our modern skulls house a stone age mind look at this very carefully our modern skulls house a stone age mind right modern and stone age it simply means this that um, the our minds okay listen to this carefully our minds are suited right our minds it is not that we do not do sophisticated things but it is important for us to understand this our minds are not suited for our current um, for, for, for the current things or the current lives that we lead okay our modern skulls house a stone age mind okay so the mind that we have may perform very sophisticated uh, tasks but actually the mind is geared to solving um, uh, you know the old adapt the adaptive problems that we or our ancestors had faced in our evolutionary history this is an immensely important point now to be and cosmides they go on to say that in the last uh, you know uh, 10 million years or 99 in the in the 99 percent this is very important 99 percent of our species evolutionary history okay was spent in hunter gatherer societies right so the mind uh, that we possess that we have today is the mind of of the hunter gatherer society and this is a thousand times longer than as anything else okay so if we have spent 99% of our species evolutionary history then obviously this this modern life that we have agriculture okay um, uh, then our uh, you know our uh, uh, then the coming in of technology right and our sophisticated and very complex social systems our cultural systems it means that this is what Tubi and Cosmides have called just an uh, you know just a blink of an eye okay they say the computer age for instance is nothing it's just a, you know is it's just a blink of an eye compared to this compared to this 99 percent of our species evolutionary history which was spent um, by us as members of hunter gatherer societies so this is how they put it the world that seems so familiar to you and me a world with roads schools grocery stores factories farms and nation states has lasted for only an eye blink of time when compared to our entire evolutionary history okay so that we have to understand and that is why they say that our you know our minds are actually those that have solved are the adaptive problems that were faced by our ancestors in the past in fact this this is very important okay let me reiterate our minds okay are designed or we have minds that are actually designed to solve adaptive problems which had been faced by our hunter gatherer ancestors therefore look at this the human brain was sculpted for what they call stone age priorities okay the stone age priorities would be finding mates raising children and gathering food you will remember when we look at the pillars of darwinian of darwinian uh, the darwinian paradigm okay finding mates raising children and gathering food these are related to the twin pillars of survival and reproduction okay of changing of adapting to changing circumstances environmental circumstances and pressures okay and you know retaining 
remember Darwin's words retaining the useful variations ok, not only that passing it on to progeny right. So, this therefore, would include A for survival, the gathering of food, the finding of mates and the raising of children ok. This is what binds us to our evolutionary past ok and our minds no matter according to this school of thought no matter no matter what complex mathematics you do ok, no matter how what complex literary forms and uh, 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 books that you write right. Ultimately, we have to understand that our minds are geared for survival and reproduction and that is why our priorities as they call it our stone age priorities uh, are for what? our brains have been. So, there is a word metaphor of sculpting because very slow process like you know wind uh, like uh, you know um, a sculpture that has been wind blown or made by the wind. There's several thousands thousands of years of sculpting. So, something that has taken so long 99 percent of our evolutionary history right is here definitely to stay and we are defined that is why we need to look at evolutionary psychology. The mind that produces right, the mind that produces uh, culture, the mind that produces different cultural forms, practices, the mind that eventually made symbolic thought possible, that mind that created signs and signifying practices is ultimately a mind that still has as its goal survival and reproduction. So, um, we will now come to the discussion and quickly we will run through a few questions. What kind of machines are our minds according to evolutionary psychology? And the answer it is according to evolutionary psychology our minds are sets of information processing machines and they this is an, an analogy to the computer. So, much so that our uh, brain is known as a wet computer. Next, what is the goal of evolutionary psychology? The goal of evolutionary psychology as we saw even in the last lecture is to discover and understand the design and structure of the human mind. Finally, what according to Tooby and Cosmides are the principles of evolutionary EP or evolutionary psychology. Uh, we will go through we have already dis, you know discussed um, the principles in detail, we will quickly run through it. The first principle is that the brain is a physical system and that it is like a computer, it is a wet computer and uh, its job is or that the job of the circuits is to, to produce behavior or to generate behavior that is environmental to sorry that is appropriate to our environment, I am very sorry appropriate to our, uh, your environmental circumstances ok. So, Principle number two is our neural circuits were designed by natural selection. Uh, that is the engineer here is or the drive motivating factor is natural selection and to solve problems. And what kind of problems? Problems that our ancestors faced during our species evolutionary history and certainly not uh, current problems. Principle number three consciousness is just the tip of the iceberg. Most of what goes on in your mind is should be hidden, hidden from you. As a result your conscious experience can mislead you into thinking that our circuitry is simpler than it really is. Most problems that you solve or that you experience as easy to solve are very difficult to solve, they require very complicated neural circuitry. Principle number 4, different neural circuits are specialized for solving different adaptive problems. And number 5 finally, our modern skulls house a stone age mind. So, if you get you know uh, if you find that there are just 3 or 4 marks then you do not need to uh, unpack these, but the way in which we have unpacked all uh, you know these 5 principles if you if there is a question carrying 10 marks for instance you will then have to describe these. For instance you will have to talk about adaptive problems the 4 main adaptive problems remember what these were these are uh, face recognition 
then threat interpretation, language and navigation these are things that one has to have okay? and these are adaptive problems which have also remained with us. It is not that we have overgrown or outgrown them, them at all. Okay? Then you need to uh, then say what consciousness is, how it is you know it, it could be awareness, it could be sub a subjective experience or the wakefulness of the mind and how you know you can give examples for instance we, we saw the example of you know uh, how even a simple uh, seemingly simple process like recognizing one's mother entails several very complicated steps okay um, said you know processing by neural circuits and we are uh, in a way allowed okay we are allowed by the pressures of survival we are allowed only the final high level conclusions right Be why the reason definitely uh, is this that you know with overloading of information uh, we uh, you know uh, our goal of survival would not be fulfilled you know there would be too much uh, information overload if we were to be aware all the time of all those hundreds of processes that go into even the most simple seemingly simple of conclusions right. So, uh, I hope uh, this has been an interesting uh, discussion for you and you may go on to read uh, evolutionary psychology which is a relatively new domain and uh, there are other things that we are going to look at for instance we are going to next look at how the modern mind originated right. We are talking about about the legacy of the mind that you know a legacy of evolution and the mind that we possess, but then in the next lecture we are also we are then going to find out how the mind that we have the modern mind uh, originated in the first place. The modern mind is in many ways of course, different from you know there are many other things that we do not just finding mates or finding food or raising children right. There are other things that we do other more complicated things and uh, this is what we shall be looking at in the next lecture. Thank you.